Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. A series of study from the Holy Scriptures based on the book of Revelation by Mark Finley. Join us as we follow the vital topics that will be presented on this study, understanding God's messages and warnings on this last days of Earth's history. Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The Book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this journey through the Book of Revelation. Revelation is the last book in the Bible and it focuses especially on Jesus Christ. Many people, when they think about the book of Revelation, think about mystic symbols. They think about cryptic images. They think about prophecy that they really can't understand. But the book of Revelation, more than any other book in the Bible, focuses on Jesus. Our topic in this presentation is Revelation's final events. Let's pray together and ask the Spirit of God to come and to touch our hearts, to encourage us, with the hopeful message of the book of Revelation. Father in heaven, we thank you for the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, a book written by John on the island of Patmos to prepare people for the soon return of Jesus. As we open the pages of that book, speak to our hearts, bring us deep conviction, stir us within and enable us to sense the glory of your soon return. In Christ's name, amen. There's something really fascinating, something really amazing about space travel. When we think about travel through space, we are awe-stricken. Which ones of us wouldn't like to take a space journey that was pretty safe? You know, some of us, when we think about space journeys, think about Nervous, then we get a little nervous, we are a little anxious. We say, I don't know if I want to step onto some space shuttle. But there is a space journey that's coming that is absolutely safe. You know, some time ago, America was quite stunned as the spacecraft Columbia blasted off. There was a, a slight problem, nothing major. Our eyes were glued to the television screens. Thousands and thousands of people were watching as that spacecraft hurtled through space. Seven of our brightest, seven of our best astronauts, some of the most talented, some of the most intelligent people were there. Bright smiles, bright eyes. But yet, as that spacecraft began to re-enter Earth's atmosphere, a minor problem that took place when the spacecraft Columbia blasted off became a great problem. The gases entered in through a crack, evidently, in the craft, and the entire space shuttle blew apart. In fact, the headlines in the newspaper were, shuttle breaks up. Time magazine quoted George Bush, president of the, at the time on February 1, 2003, as saying, the Columbia is lost. And then he said, America is saddened today. There are no survivors. This space journey began fairly well, but it ended with no survivors. The space journey that you and I are preparing for is one that's not going to only begin well, it's one that's going to end well. The space journey that we are preparing for is, a, is the space journey of the ages. Our commander is going to get us home. We can have absolute certainty that as we begin this space journey from Earth, when Jesus Christ returns again, that Jesus will get us home. We will travel. We'll travel beyond the moon, our nearest neighbor at 250,000 miles in space. We'll travel beyond the stars and the planets, travel beyond the sun, 93 million miles from here, travel beyond Pluto and Jupiter and Saturn. 
will travel through the sky, up through that open space in Orion, and travel millions of miles in space to our eternal home, where there is no sickness, where there's no sorrow, where there's no suffering, where there is no death. There is one thing that I'm certain about, many things I'm certain about, but one thing for sure, this world is not our home. When I read the newspaper and I see the gruesome details of war, I know this world is not our home. When I read about children with distended bellies that are starving to death whose mother's milk has run out, I know that this world is not our home. When I read about terrorist acts and innocent people being killed, I know that this world is not our home. When I read of car accidents and young adults being killed instantly, I know that this world is not our home. When I read about drunk men coming home and beating their wives, breaking their noses, blood running down their face, I know that this world is not our home. One day, we're gonna travel. Travel beyond the stars. Travel beyond the sun. Travel through that open space in Orion to the very throne of God. The promise of God is that Jesus will soon return. 1,500 times in the Bible, the Bible discusses the return of Jesus. For every eight prophecies, for every one prophecy in the Old Testament on the first coming of Christ, there are eight prophecies on the second coming of Christ. Once in every 25 verses in the New Testament, it talks about the second coming of our Lord. God's end time plan is clearly revealed in his word. There are many people that are quite confused about the second coming of Christ. You read books and one book says this thing and the next book says that thing about the return of Christ. Christianity is quite confused about it. Some people have the idea of a secret rapture. They have the idea of a seven year tribulation. Other people believe Jesus is coming in glory, power, majesty. Some people believe Christ is coming to set up his kingdom on earth. Some people believe that the second coming of Christ is kind of a spiritual coming where there's peace, nirvana, love on earth. So many confusing ideas. I love that old poem. What says the Bible, the blessed Bible to me? This my only question be, what says the Bible, the blessed Bible to me? Wouldn't you agree that this is the book of books? Other books written by men pale into insignificance in the light of the book of books. The word of God gives us certainty about the events of the second coming of Christ. Now when we look at the book of Revelation, the central theme of Revelation is Jesus. In fact, Revelation chapter one verse one says, the revelation of who? The revelation of who? Jesus Christ. So the book of Revelation is not a confusing book. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation 22, that the book of Revelation is not sealed. The book of Revelation is an open book. The theme of Revelation is Jesus. And there are two great mountain peaks in Revelation. First, the Lamb of God, mentioned 27 times in Revelation, speaks of the first coming of Christ. And then Jesus, pictured as a king, speaks of the second coming of Christ. Revelation chapter 14, verse 14, describes this glorious event of Christ's coming. It says, then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and, one, uh, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. The Son of God became the Son of Man, so sons of men could become the sons of God. <laughs> Jesus, the divine Son of God, tabernacled in human flesh to show us what God was like and to share with us the keys to victory over temptation and sin. So it is the Son of Man that comes back. 
the one that walked the dusty streets of Galilee, the one that walked the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem. He is Jesus, our friend. He's coming to take us home. We need not fear his coming. The Bible says, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Golden crown indicating his kingly authority. Sharp sickle indicating the end, the harvest of this world. The book of Revelation speaks about the glory, the beauty of the second coming of Jesus. Jesus came once as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. When he came that time, did many people recognize Jesus, did they? When he came once, just a few recognized him as Messiah, very, very few. The wise men came, shepherds gathered there around Jesus' uh, birthplace, but very few recognized him. So we could say that once, he came in a sense secretly, but when he comes the second time, the Bible teaches that he'll come in glory, he'll come in splendor. The Bible teaches that this will be no secret event at all. He came once to enter in the kingdom of grace, he is coming again to enter it, to bring in the kingdom of glory. Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. Jesus is faithful to his promise. He promised he would come again. He is faithful. Jesus' promises are true. Many people make promises and they don't follow through on them. But Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are what? Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I might come again. I, it's possible that I'll come again. Maybe I'll come again. What does Jesus say? I what? will come again. And the one who returns is the one who's faithful and the one who is true, the one whose promises never fail. Jesus promised to return and he will be faithful to his promise. And in righteousness, there is a lot in this world that is not righteous, it's unfair, it's unjust, but Christ is coming with all the glory of his righteousness. He judges sin, he makes war on evil, and he triumphs over it. The armies in heaven were clothed in fine linen. This is all the angels who come with him, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Why this white horse symbol in Revelation? What does the symbol of a white horse, why would God use that symbol of a white horse? A white horse in the Bible is a symbol of purity, it's a symbol of victory, and it's a symbol of triumph. The book of Revelation was written in the first century. And it was written in the days of the Roman Empire. And when the Roman armies conquered a new nation, when the Roman general came back to Rome, he always led a procession on a white horse. So he always would ride on a white horse, indicating the strength indicating the authority of the Roman Empire and indicating the victory and the triumph of the Roman Empire. So when the Bible pictures Christ coming on a white horse, it is describing Jesus Christ triumphing over all the powers of evil, triumphing all for all the powers of wickedness, Jesus as the victorious Lord. Revelation 11, verse 15, notice again and again and again in Revelation, we have this great theme of the coming of Jesus Christ. Revelation 11, verse 15, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and and ever. The kingdoms of this world will fade into insignificance. The buildings of this world will come crumbling down, but Jesus will reign forever and ever. Do you see why the book of Revelation is the most hopeful book in all the Bible? Because human beings are looking for solutions to problems that defy those solutions. Human beings are looking for solutions to the pollution of the world, to the global warming of the world, to the war of the world, to the famine of the world. But yet, as hard as they try, and as Christians, we applaud all efforts for peace. 
We applaud all efforts to feed the hungry. We applaud all efforts to treat disease. But here's what we know. No human solution, no human solution can solve the problems of this world. There is only one that can solve those problems. And there's only one event that can bring that solution. When the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord, the kingdoms of men rise and fall. Nations have their place on the stage of human history, but they rise and fall. But Jesus' kingdom will reign. He shall reign. What does it say? Forever and ever and ever. His kingdom will last through all eternity. Now, how will Jesus come back the second time? And how can I know, more importantly, that I'll be ready when he comes? Many people have different ideas about how Jesus is going to come. But the Bible is very clear. The first thing that we want to notice is this, that there will be those that claim that Christ is returned. Luke 17 verse 23 says, and they will say to you, look here or look there. But Jesus says, do not go after them or follow them. In other words, there will be those that see in what they believe a being of dazzling brightness, there will be those that see in that being one that they believe is the Messiah. What if a Messiah-like being of dazzling brightness appeared in Los Angeles? What if he appeared there in the great Colosseum, spoke to thousands, and they were being healed? What if a Christ-like being, being of dazzling brightness, angelic being, appeared? What indeed if he appeared? in a place like Chicago in Grant Park and spoke to thousands? What if he appeared in St. Louis? What if he appeared in New York City in Times Square? What if he appeared in Paris or England, London, England or Beijing, China? What if thousands were being healed? Would you go to see him? What does Jesus say? Do not go there. Why not? Because the Bible says, Luke 17, verse 24, as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to another part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. Jesus Christ is not coming as some cosmic master, some being of dazzling brightness to walk on the earth at this time. Christ is coming in the clouds of heaven. Christ is coming down from above. He won't rise up up from below. Our Jesus is coming in the clouds of heaven. Now Satan can appear as a being of dazzling brightness. Satan can masquerade and appear as Christ. Satan could walk up and down on this earth, but Satan does not have the power to come in the clouds of heaven like a glorious being and raise the dead. Only Jesus Christ can do that. Satan has a plan to deceive the multitudes. Wouldn't the devil try to counterfeit and impersonate the second coming of Christ? When all humanity is looking for solutions to their problems, wouldn't that be something that you think the devil might do? Now, five facts about the coming of Christ. First, Christ's coming will be a literal event. It's not some spiritual coming. Jesus is not some cosmic master that's going to come in, in some vague, vapory way and bring peace nirvana on earth. The coming of Christ is a literal event. Jesus ascended up in the sky literally. He'll return literally. The Bible says, Acts 1 verse 11, this same Jesus, this what Jesus? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven. The disciples were looking up, straining their eyes to see Jesus as he ascended into heaven. Man steps off a mountain and goes down. God steps off a mountain and goes up. Because the law of gravity cannot keep down the creator of gravity. This same Jesus who's been taken up from you into heaven, the disciples look, the angels come, and they say to the disciples in these very words, will so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Jesus ascended into heaven in glory, he will return in glory. He ascended into heaven, 
he will return the same way he went up. A real Christ ascended and a real Christ will what? Descend. We look at scripture and recognize that this is no supposed cosmic master who's gonna walk on earth. He is coming down from the sky in glory. Now Christ's coming will not only be a literal event, it'll be a visible event, not only seen by the righteous, but also seen by all humanity. The Bible makes that very plain. Revelation 1 verse seven says, behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, the eyes of the young and the eyes of the old, the eyes of the educated and the eyes of the uneducated. Chinese eyes will see him come and European eyes will see him come and Asian eyes will see him come and the eyes of Europeans will see him come and the eyes of Americans will see him come and the eyes of Australians will see him come. The Bible says what? Every eye will see him come. Now somebody says, well, Pastor Mark, I thought only the righteous were gonna see him and that there are kind of two phases of his second coming. The Bible does not teach that. It teaches that every eye will see Jesus when he comes. Christ's coming will also be an audible event. Not only literal, a real Christ, not only visible, a, that we'll see him come, but it will be an audible event. Not only will every eye see it, but every ear will hear Jesus, this event. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a, with a what? A shout. Now that doesn't seem very silent, does it? With a what? Shout. With a what? Shout. A shout. The Bible says with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Have you lost some loved one by death, a father or a mother? You've laid them in some grassy grave on a hillside, and you can't wait to see your mom again. You can't wait to see your father again. What about that baby that died in childbirth? You long to see them again. What about that son or that grandson? What about that, that friend? Tears run down your face as you hear the story of their death, but the Bible says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the trumpet of victory, and the dead in Christ shall do what? They shall rise first. One evening I was standing on the platform of one of the great auditoriums in our world and I was talking about the second coming of Christ. I had just talked about this passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter four. And as I did, I said, how can I make it real to my audience? How can I, how can I just describe the second coming of Christ so powerfully that people long to be ready for his coming? So I described a scene and I said, suppose you had a little baby. And let's suppose that baby's name was Amanda. I don't know why I used that name. I had never used that name before. It's a common name, but not a super common name in America. And so I said, suppose you had a little baby called Amanda. And suppose at six months, Amanda died in a crib death. She, she suffocated in the crib. And suppose you buried her and your heart was just broken over the death of Amanda. And imagine, you're at her grave, and there as you're praying, longing with tears coming down your face to see Amanda again, the earth shakes, the sky illuminates with the glory of God, Christ comes with 10,000 times 10,000 angels, the sky is illuminated with the glory of God, and Jesus calls Amanda come forth, and that grave opens, and that little baby comes out, and the angel puts that baby in your hands again, and those little hands, begin to pat your cheeks and you look into that little face and you ascend in heaven with Jesus to, in the sky. At the end of the meeting, a lady came up to me, said, Pastor, can I talk to you? I said, sure. She said, how did you know? I said, how did I know what? How did you know I had a little baby? A baby that died in the crib at six months. And how did you know that that baby's name was Amanda? I said, I've never used that name in a sermon before. 
but the Holy Spirit impressed me to use that name at that moment just for you because Jesus loves you so much. Jesus wants you in eternity. Jesus wants you to be with him and he wants you to know that one day he can put that baby back in your arms again. Christ comes with a trumpet symbolizing the blast that will wake the dead, symbolizing victory. He comes with a sickle symbolizing that earth comes to an end and earth's harvest indeed is over. The Bible puts it this way, the dead in Christ shall rise first, the grave Graves are open, the dead come out. Then scripture says that we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The Bible says we shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Your mother is going to be looking for you. That mother that was so faithful to Christ, she's going to be looking for you. That friend that you prayed with and studied the Bible with, they're going to be looking for you. That son, that daughter, dad's going to be looking for you. Dad, don't walk away from Christ now. Dad, don't turn your back on Christ now because what if your son is saved and he's looking through heaven? He says, where's my father? I want him to be here. Children, your parents are going to be looking for you. This is no time to walk away from Christ. Your parents are going to be looking for you. What does the Bible say? We're caught up together with them. Think of the joyous celebration. Think of the jubilation. Think of the thrill of being caught up together in the air. You don't want to miss that for some of the cheap pleasures of this life. The Bible is clear. We will be caught up together. I love the word together. Families holding hands, husbands, wives, parents, children with them in the clouds. To do what? To meet the Lord. Where? We gonna meet him on earth? Meet the Lord where? In the air. The devil can never counterfeit that. Christ is coming literally. Christ is coming so that every eye will see him. Christ is coming so every ear will hear it. Christ is coming to raise the dead. Christ is coming to give immortality to the living and we ascend through the sky with Jesus. So shall we ever, not temporarily, not momentarily, so shall we what? Ever be with the Lord in eternity. Life is short. We appear here momentarily and then we're off the scene's history. But Jesus is coming and we can ever be with the Lord. Notice Matthew 24, verse 26. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, or look, he's in New York, or Chicago, or Los Angeles, wherever. Look, he's in the desert. Do not go out. Why not? Because our Christ is coming in glory to raise the dead. Now, Christ's coming will be an incredibly glorious event. It is the event of the ages. Matthew 24, verse 27, again, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So this is no secret event. It's like lightning shining from the east to the west. A real Christ is coming in the sky. He's coming to redeem his people. He's coming to resurrect the dead. He's coming down through the Carter of Orion in glory and power and majesty. He is coming soon. Now, the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 30, the Son of Man will appear in heaven. This is a key verse. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Now, notice it does not say that only the righteous will see him when he comes. It does not say that he's coming to rapture his saints, not at all. He's coming literally, he's coming visibly so that every eye sees it, he's coming audibly so every ear hears it, he's coming to raise the dead, but notice it does not say in the text that only the righteous will see him. It says, the Son of Man will appear in heaven, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Remember, Revelation 1 verse 7 said, every what? 
I would see him. Does that mean the unrighteous will see him as he comes? Let's let the Bible speak for itself. What does the scripture say? And they, that is the tribes of the earth, that is the unrighteous, that is the unsaved, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So when Jesus comes, there are not two phases of his coming divided by a seven year tribulation. When Jesus comes, comes the second time to return, every eye sees him. The righteous see him and the wicked see him. The saved see him and the unsaved see him. The holy see him and the unholy see him. When Jesus comes, there is a great divide. When Jesus comes, the righteous look up and they are just delighted and thrilled and they're filled with joy and jubilation when Christ comes. When the unrighteous see him, they run for the rocks and mountains to fall upon them. They are frightened at his coming. Christ's coming is gonna be a climactic event. Really, Christ's coming is the climax of human history. When Jesus Christ comes, all of history comes to one focal point. When Jesus Christ comes, all of history comes to an end as we know it. History is not secular, going around in circle after circle after circle with no end point. History had a beginning point. God created this world in six literal days and rested on the seventh. Six 24-hour periods and the seventh 24-hour period, the Sabbath. History had a beginning point. This world had a beginning point. And this world will have an end point. Jesus came in history once when he died on the cross. He will come at a point in history a second time, a glorious climactic event. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 to 53, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet of victory, the trumpet of triumph at the last trumpet. The Bible then goes on to say, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. We have corruptible bodies, we have mortal bodies. Our bodies are subject to disease, they're subject to pain, they're subject to suffering, they're subject to death. But one day Jesus is going to come. The trumpet's going to sound and these bodies of ours are going to be raised what? incorruptible, no more suffering, no more sickness, no more disease, no more heartache, no more cancer. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Mortal means subject to disease and death and decay. Immortality, living forever and ever and ever with Jesus Christ through the ceaseless ages of eternity. Christ comes and we are ushered through the carter of the sky to live with him him forever and ever and ever in eternal glory where there is no worry, no fear, no anxiety. Sometimes does your stomach get tightened and you get a little worried? Sometimes do you get headaches because you're under such tension? Sometimes does fear grip your soul? Just think of what it's going to be like to live in a world where there is no worry. You never worry about anything again. Think about it, what it's going to be like to live in a world where there is no fear. You never fear. Think of what it's going to be like to live in a world where there is no evil, no sickness, no war, no heartache, no suffering, no death. That's going to be an amazing world, isn't it? I don't want to miss it, do you? Jesus is coming to usher in eternity. And one day we with the whole universe will sing from the depths of our soul, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. We will see that the way God dealt with the controversy between good and evil, this controversy between Christ and Satan, this great controversy in the universe, we will see that in the way God dealt with that controversy has been fair and just and right. It has demonstrated his love forever and that's why sin will never rise a second time because Jesus has dealt with the controversy in a way to reveal before a waiting world, 
before a watching universe the majesty, the greatness, and the beauty of his love. Just think of what it's going to be like when he comes. Husbands embracing their wives and saying, it's over, it's over, it's over. No, honey, it's not over. It's just beginning. And we ascend to heaven. Think of what it's going to be like for mothers to grasp the hands of those children again. Think of what it's going to be like in that glorious day to ascend through the sky. You say, Pastor, that's too good to be true. It's too good not to be true. In your heart, you know that you were created for something better. In your heart, you long for that something better in Jesus. We will look up, Isaiah 25, verse 9, we'll cry out, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him. Now, underline circle, we've waited. And he will save us, we've waited for him. We've not surrendered to the cheap, tawdry pleasures of this world. We've waited for him. We've not sold out like Judas did for a few pieces of silver in this life. We have done what? We've waited for him. We've not accepted the false Christ. We've not been deceived by the false Messiah. We've not accepted the one that's come to this earth as a being of dazzling brightness and walked on the earth and claimed he could heal. We have waited for Christ. He will save us. Notice, this is the Lord. We have waited for him and we will be glad in his salvation. We are rejoicing. But there is another class. You know, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, behold, now is the accepted time. When is the accepted time? The only way to be ready for Christ is to get ready today and stay ready. Behold, what? Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Christ appeals to us not to get ready tomorrow. If you're watching this broadcast, here in this auditorium, and you said, you know, I, I, I feel a stirring in my heart. I sense that this world doesn't have much to offer, but I, I'm hesitating. There's something that I don't want to let go. I just haven't come to the place of a full commitment to Christ yet. The longer you wait, the harder it's going to become. Now is the day of salvation. You didn't turn into this broadcast by accident. You're not in this auditorium by accident. Christ brought you here. If there's something in your heart, something in your life, Christ wants you to get that settled now. Because now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Our eternal destiny is being settled by the choices that we make today. The choices that we make today either tie us and bind us and lock us in sin or the choice to accept his grace, the choice to accept his pardon, the choice to accept his power. That's a life-changing choice that frees us, that liberates us. Now, some people say, well, pastor, summarize it. Summarize all the events that happen when Jesus comes. Here they are. First, what happens when Jesus comes? There'll be seismic upheavals. The Bible says every mountain and every island will be moved out of its place. Seismic upheavals. Secondly, the righteous dead will be resurrected. Thirdly, the righteous living will be changed. Fourth, the immortality will be stowed on the righteous dead and living, and they will ascend to heaven with Christ. The wicked living will be destroyed by the brightness of Jesus coming. They will not live on earth. Sixth, the righteous will welcome Christ as they ascend to heaven together. And seven, all of the righteous will be ushered into eternity. Those are the events that surround the coming of Christ. But somebody says, Pastor Mark, I, I really still have some questions. And I've heard a lot about something called the secret rapture. And what about this idea of the secret rapture? Where does that come from? And, you know, I'm a little confused because doesn't the Bible say that Christ is going to come as a thief? Isn't that implying secretly? And doesn't the Bible say there'll be two in the field, one will be taken, one will be left? And doesn't that kind of imply that uh, Jesus' coming is kind of secret? I see all those texts in the Bible that you read, and they're pretty clear, but help me with these texts. I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> 
Let's go to the secret rapture and take a little look about it. First, we need to keep clear on this. Matthew 24, verse 36. When the Bible talks about the second coming of Christ, it says, but of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Well, the first thing we notice is this. When somebody comes to you with a time chart and says, this is when Christ is gonna come, I've got all this figured out, beware. Because Jesus says, but of that day and hour, what? Nobody knows. So, what then does Jesus say after that? He says, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour, what's another expression for one hour? What is that? What time the thief would come? He would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken up. So in other words, the, pres the references in the Bible to Jesus coming as a thief are not speaking about the manner of his coming, but the time of his coming. The references in the Bible that speak about Jesus coming as a thief don't deal with the time at all. They deal with the manner. Rather, they don't deal with the manner at all. They deal with the time. It's the time that these prophecies deal with, not the manner of Christ's coming. If a thief comes to your house, does the thief say, get ready, I'm coming at one o'clock in the morning? Is that what the thief says? Does the, is that the way the thieves do it here in, in around 3 AB? No, you don't have any thieves here. This is paradise. Um, no, is that what the thieves do? That they say, here I come. I'm coming now. No. So when the Bible talks about Christ coming as a thief, it's not talking about manner. He's coming so that every eye can see him. That's the manner of his coming. He's coming so every ear can hear it. That's the manner of his coming. He's coming to raise the dead, the lightning in heaven. But we do not know the time. So he's coming quickly. He's coming unexpectedly like a thief. When Jesus comes as a thief, the world will not expect it. Just like in the days of Noah. Did they expect the flood to take place in the days of Noah? Not at all. Just like in the days of Lot. Did they expect fire to come down and burn Sodom and Gomorrah? Not at all. When Jesus comes as a thief, the world will not expect it. Now, here is one of the clearest references that the Bible says to explain that. Verse 43 says he's coming at a thief. Verse 44 says, therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at a what? At a what? Hour you do not expect. So the thief imagery in the Bible does not speak about the manner of Christ's coming. It speaks about the time of his coming. He comes quickly. He comes rapidly. He comes unexpectedly like a thief. Now Peter makes this plain. 2 Peter 3 verse 10. And this should really answer the rapture question about Christ coming as a thief and the idea that he's coming secretly. Look what it says. But the day of the Lord will come as a what? Thief in the night. You know, there was a movie about, called The Thief in the Night about the rapture that said he's coming secretly. Totally contrary to this text. But the day of the Lord will come as a what? Thief in the night. And what happens when he comes as a thief in the night? Which the heavens will pass away with great what? noise that's not very secret and then it says and the elements will melt with fervent heat both the earth and the works that are in will be burned up so this whole thief imagery has to do with the second coming of Christ and subsequently the millennial period after that in the coming of Jesus when Jesus comes the second time the earth is destroyed, it's left desolate, and then eventually it's burned up. This whole thief imagery has to do with he's coming quickly and this world will be a thing of the past. Now the second coming of Christ is a surprise to people that are unprepared. He comes as a thief to the unprepared. He comes quickly, unexpectedly, rapidly. Now somebody says, what about the expression one taken and one left? That expression is found in Matthew chapter 24, and it's also found in Luke chapter 17. Now, some people have this idea. Well, you know, we are going to be taken away in the rapture, and then other people are going to be left alive on earth. It's rather fascinating. Let me just take my Bible momentarily and take it and turn to Matthew the 24th chapter. Matthew chapter 24, and I want to surprise you with this text. What's the popular idea of those that teach the rapture? Oh, those people are taken away in the rapture and the others are left alive. Well, this is rather fascinating. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, verse 36, 
but of that day and hour no one knows, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father. Then notice what it says, verse 37. But as the days of Noah, as the days of what, everybody? Noah. Noah. As the days of Noah, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. What, what's it going to be like, the days of Noah? For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. What happened to those who were taken away by the flood? What happened to them? They died. Well, the idea of the rapture is we're taken away in the rapture. The Bible doesn't say that. When these people were taken away, they were taken away into the flood and died. Now, when you come to Luke, the 17th chapter, you have something very interesting here. Two men will be in the field, one taken and one left. Now, here it reverses the symbolism. What happens to the people that are left? Are those that are left left alive on earth? Not at all as it was in the days of, of Noah. What happened in the days of Noah? Two classes. One went into the ark, one did not go into the ark. The ones that went into the ark were saved. The ones that did not go into the ark were destroyed. Likewise, the Bible says, as it was in the days of Lot. So in the days of Lot. What happens in the days of Lot? Well, two classes. Those that leave the city are what? saved, those that stay in the city are what? Burnt. So likewise as it was in the days of Lot, there are two classes. Two classes. Days of Noah, one saved, one lost. Days of Lot, one saved and one lost. Two classes. Days of Noah, some are alive, they go into the ark. Some are destroyed, they stay out of the ark. Days of Lot, some stay in the city, they're consumed and burned. Some come out of the city and they are what? They are saved. So when the Bible talks about one taken, one left, it's talking about two classes. One class are saved and one class are lost. One class are alive and one class are destroyed. The Bible is very clear. What happens when Jesus comes? There is no rapture. There are two classes to make their eternal decision for or against Christ. Revelation 6, verse 15 to 17. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every freeman hid themselves in the rocks, the caves of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. How horrible it is. Jesus created them to live with him forever. Jesus created them to be with him through all eternity. Jesus created them to live, but they run, they hide from the face of the Lamb 27 times in the book of Revelation, it talks about the lamb. The lamb who came, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The lamb will provide salvation for all mankind. The lamb who reaches out with love, hangs on Calvary's cross to save humanity, but they're frightened. They've never come to Jesus in this life. They've never given him their lives, and so they run in fear. Two classes, one filled with joy, one filled with fear. Two classes. For one, it's the happiest day of their life. For the other, it's the saddest day of their life. Two classes. For one, it's a new beginning. For the other, it's a tragic ending. And every single one of us have that choice. What will I do with Jesus? Will I accept him as my Lord and Savior? Will I give him my life? Will I live with him forever? Or will on that day, in horror and agony, I run from the one who longs to save me? You see, Jesus wants to save every human being, but he can't. If Jesus brought all of Chicago to heaven, would it be heaven? Or would it be Chicago? If Jesus brought all of New York, of all of Los Angeles to heaven, would it be heaven or would it be New York and Los Angeles? See, until you have heaven up there, you've got to have heaven down here. Until you can live in the kingdom up there, you have to have the kingdom right in here. And that's what Jesus is doing right now. He's building a people 
who want to live in heaven more than they want to live on earth, who want to live in eternity more than they want to live in time, who want to live in a land of glory rather than a land of degradation and sickness, and they cry out, these lost, for the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? And the answer to that question is those that have been saved and redeemed by the grace of Christ. You see, there is no second opportunity. The time to get serious about your salvation is now. This is no time for playing around. This is no time for fiddling on the knife edge of eternity. This is no time to push Christ out of your life. Christ's coming will be literal. Christ's coming will be visible. Christ's coming will be audible. Christ's coming will be glorious. Christ's coming will be climactic. And Christ's coming will be a joyous event. Remember Jesus' promise in John 14, verse 2 and 3. We quoted it earlier. Here it is from the screen. I go to prepare a place for you. And Jesus can't wait for you to be there with him. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That's what the second coming of Christ is all about. The second coming of Christ is not primarily about destroying the earth. It's not primarily about destroying wicked people who are destroyed because they turn from the claims of his love. The primary reason for the second coming of Christ is stated here. I am coming to receive you to myself. Jesus is coming for you. He no longer wants you to live in a world of heartache or sorrow or disappointment. No longer wants you to live in a world of pain, suffering. No longer wants you to live in a world of tears. He cannot stand to be away from you any longer. So he's coming. He's coming for you. Think of it. Think of the promise that every father has, every mother has, every son has, every daughter has on that day when their loved one dies. Think of the promise, Jesus says, I will come again to receive you unto myself. I will come and lightning will flash through the sky. I will come and mothers will receive their babies in their arms again. I will come and friends will embrace one another once again. Jesus says, I will come and sin and sorrow and suffering and heartache will be over. I will come and the dead will be resurrected. I will come and children will be placed in their mother's arms again. I will come and dads will embrace their kids again. I will come and men and women from all ages will come. They'll be resurrected from the north to the south to the east to the west. They'll come out of their graves. They'll rise with me in glory. And Jesus says, I will come again. Is there anything, anything that would keep you from being ready for the coming of Jesus. Anything deep within your heart. You see, there's only one thing that can satisfy now and forever, and that's Jesus. And Jesus is reaching out to you today. You know, I was 17 years old, and I didn't know anything about the Bible, didn't know anything about Jesus. And my dad, said to me one Saturday night, he said, you're hitchhiking to the dance, aren't you? I said, yeah, Dad, I'm hitchhiking to the dance. He said, you know, it may rain, you may get all wet, and you're not going to look too good when you go to that dance. What time's the dance start? About 9 o'clock, Dad. Hey, look, there's a meeting going on about 7 o'clock at night. It's across from the dance, and there's a preacher that's speaking. Why don't you go? I'll take you and then run across to the dance. You see, my dad was a Seventh-day Adventist believing in the second coming of Christ, but I wasn't. And dad was very wise. I got in the car. I didn't want to hitchhike and stand on the cold road. He took me to that meeting. It was kind of boring the first night, at least I thought it was. I ran across to the dance. But the second night, the preacher talked about the second coming of Christ. And they sang a song, Open mine eyes that I may see. Glimpses of truth illumine me. And that second night, I fell on my knees. I said, Jesus, open my eyes. Help me see the glory of eternity. And Jesus, get me ready for your coming. Ask Jesus to open your eyes. Ask Jesus to touch your heart. Ask Jesus to speak to you right now as Celestine sings.
you like to say to Jesus right now, Lord, open my eyes. May the things of earth fade into insignificance. May the things of time fade into eternity. Lord, open my eyes. Help me to see you in all of your beauty and all of your glory. Lord, open my eyes. Help me not be so entranced with the things of this world that I miss eternity. The greatest event in the history of the ages is the second coming of Christ. And if you miss it, if you miss it, you have missed everything in life without the second coming of Christ. The grave is a dark hole in the ground and death is a long night without the morning. But with the second coming of Christ, there is hope. Hope to see our loved ones again hope to be with our children, our families again. Hope that this old world will be recreated like the Garden of Eden again. As we bow our heads to pray, would you like to say, Jesus, open my eyes to see the glory of eternity. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, come. Come, and as the old song says, open up mine eyes that I can see. Glimpses of truth illumine me, spirit divine. Father, we thank you that there is hope for this world. We thank you that death is not a dead end. We thank you that we were created for a life and not death. We thank you that you've got a much better world, that there's a world of tomorrow coming, that one day we'll be caught up to meet Christ in the sky and travel beyond the sun, the moon, and the stars to eternity. Oh, Jesus. We surrender our lives to you to be ready for that great event. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for joining us for Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. We are going to be probing the great prophecies of this book and looking more deeply into each chapter of the book of Revelation. So stay with us here on 3ABN and be blessed today.